in the name of the Lord. It's a pleasure to have you here in worship with us today. Uh, as we get started, just a number of announcements. First of all, doesn't it feel like Christmas in here? I mean, so uh, big thanks to everybody who helped to not only do the decorations, but the poinsettias, the lights, everything like that just adds to everything just so wonderfully. Um, in addition to that, since we're talking about Christmas, just a reminder that our worship services will be at 4 o'clock, at 4.30, at 7 o'clock, and at 11 on Christmas Eve. The 4 o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service will be in here, the 4.30 and the 7 o'clock service will be in the Celebration Center. As a part of that whole Christmas thing that's going on as well, I would also like to remind you that today, if you would like to come back to church again at the 1035 worship service, you're certainly welcome to do so. Don't worry, you won't have to listen to the sermon again. Because the kids of the Sunday School program are going to be presenting the Christmas story. And so um, if you'd like to see them and do that, that would be wonderful. Next week will be the service of music, and the choir will be leading us, and so we hope that you're looking forward to that. I am. And let's see, other announcements that we have. Middle Mixers is going to be having their Christmas party on December 13th, and there's information on the ski trip that's going to be taking place for the youth. Other announcements, I'm sure you can look over carefully and respond appropriately to them. Would the congregation please rise? Peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share that peace with one another. like the third candle to remind us that Jesus is our Prince of Peace. In a world filled with conflict, tension, and discord, we look for the peace that comes through Christ alone.
continue our Advent journey. We acknowledge that our surroundings are often far from peaceful. By your spirit, help us to be agents of peace in the world around us. Throughout this season, continue to fill us with the peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The opening hymn is hymn number 267. <laughs>
Lord. Merciful God, always with us, always coming. We confess that we do not know how to prepare for your advent. We have forgotten how to hope in miracles. We have ignored the promise of your kingdom. We get distracted by all the busyness of the season. Forgive us, God. Grant us the simple wonder of the shepherds, the intelligent courage of the magi, and the patient faith of Mary and Joseph, that we may journey with them to Bethlehem and find the good news of a child born for us. Now, in the quiet of our hearts, we ask you to make us ready for his coming. Amen. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Your sins are pardoned. The penalty is paid. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Children to Abraham. 
Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds ask him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. Jesus answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may remain standing to him as number 269. <laughs>
some of the history of Israel and how God had made a promise to David that his son would sit on Israel's throne forever. And so then I explained to them that when we say Jesus Christ, Christ is not Jesus' last name. So if you take the word Christ, which is Greek, and translate it into Hebrew, it becomes Messiah. If you translate Messiah into English, you can translate that either as the anointed one or as the king. So when we say Jesus Christ, we're saying Jesus our king on that. And so that got me thinking about kings and kingdoms, and it started to dawn on me that it's, it's not really just about the king. It's supposed to be about the kingdom. And if you're still not following a little bit of what's going on, let me see if I can give you an illustration that I think at least most folks in Nebraska might be able to relate to. There was a young boy who grew up in Hastings, and he played things like basketball and football here. He graduated from Hastings High School. He went on and continued his education and his athletic career at Hastings College so, so far. Not very eventful, not very remarkable. But finally, rather than going through his entire career, let me just jump to the end on this. <laughs> finally, he became the head football coach for the University of Nebraska Cornhuskers. Everybody know who I'm talking about now? I mean, it's the legendary Tom Osborne, right? And so here's the deal, is that I actually believe that at this point in time that Tom Osborne is the football coach, even though he retired some 17 years ago from coaching football back in 1998, I think that Tom Osborne is the football coach by which all Nebraska football coaches are judged. What do you guys think? I think that Frank Solich, Bill Callahan, Bo Pelini, Mike Riley, all live in the shadow of Tom Osborne. <coughs> Here's the deal, is that it wasn't about the king. It was about the kingdom. Or another way to say that is, if Tom Osborne had not been able to get his teams to perform on the football field, he would probably be remembered just as well as Bill Jennings, Bernard Masterson, or Adolf Lutnowski. Anybody know any of those folks? They were all football coaches at the University of Nebraska as well. They held the position. You could say they have the title, but it wasn't about just the king. It was about the kingdom. It's important for us to remember that this time of year because, because I hear a lot of different things. Some people say that there's a war against Christmas that's going on now, others say no. You see signs up in various places or sometimes posts on places in the internet, like on Facebook or on Twitter or on Pinterest, that say things like, Jesus is the reason for the season, because some folks are maybe afraid that we're forgetting that Christmas begins with Christ, or that holiday begins with the word holy. And of course, for years, preachers have been preaching sermons about how there's too much stress on commercialism and not enough emphasis on Jesus during this time of year. But when I was reading through the gospel text for today, something else dawned on me. And that's what I'm here to tell you today. God the Father did not send Jesus the Son so that he could be king. God was already king. God was king anyway without doing that. 
whether we choose or whether our society chooses to acknowledge that or not, makes no bearing on the fact that God is still king. And God did not become in flesh. God did not become incarnate. God did not need to become Emmanuel. God did not step down and appear as a baby in a manger in a cattle stall in Bethlehem to prove that he was king because he was king already. And quite frankly, I sometimes really think that Jesus was less interested in being king and more interested in establishing a kingdom. <coughs> and if you're not sure that's true, then just remember with me that in the course of the telling of the, uh, all the gospel lessons, I don't remember Jesus walking around very often and saying, I am the Messiah, and you better believe it. I don't remember Jesus trying to make sure that he corrected everyone by telling them he was the Christ. I don't remember very often Jesus saying that he was the anointed one or that you should address him as king. But what I did hear Jesus saying an awful lot is when he told stories that we call parables that turned our world on end, he would often introduce them by saying, the kingdom will be like this. And when Jesus did all kinds of miracles where he did things like helping the lame to walk or the blind to see or the deaf to hear, after he was done, he didn't say, and as a result of that, you should proclaim me as king. Instead, after he was done with all of those miracles, he would often say, the kingdom has come near to you. And so it started to dawn on me that it's really not just about the king. It's about the kingdom. Don't get me wrong, still I understand that without the right kind of king, you don't get the right kind of kingdom. Because the king, the one who rules, or the one who even more effectively, the king is the one who sets the example of what should be established in the kingdom. <clears throat> But you can still see that it's not really just about the king, but about the kingdom as we walk through the text that we have for today. In the text for today, John the Baptist, the prophet, the one who's supposed to anoint the next king, proclaims the advent of the king, Jesus. And he proclaims that there is one who is more powerful than I that is coming after me. He says, the sandal of his, he, I, I'm not worthy to untie. He says that, well, John baptizes with the water, the king will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. But after that, John has a whole lot to say about, not about the king, but about what's wrong with this kingdom. And so he starts to talk about winnowing forks and threshing floors and gathering wheat into the granary, but burning chaff with unquenchable fire. He starts talking a lot about Abraham as our ancestor and how God could rose, raise up stones that would be children of Abraham, or about how even now the ax was laid to the root of the tree. But then when people start to ask John questions about what all of this means, he doesn't respond with who the king is. He responds with what the kingdom will be like. And so consequently, John tells them, the kingdom will be like this, bear fruit worthy of repentance. The kingdom will be like this, everyone who has two coats must share with anyone who does not have a coat. The kingdom will be like this, anyone who has food must share with somebody who does not have food. The kingdom will be like this. Collect no more than what is prescribed to you. The kingdom will be like this. Don't exhort, don't threaten, don't have false accusations. The kingdom will be like this. Be satisfied with your wages. How many of you guys agree with me that much of what John the Baptist has to say isn't just about the king? It's about the kingdom. 
Jesus didn't come to be king. He already was. Jesus came to establish a kingdom. I want to be clear about that because if you just say this Christmas that Jesus is king and then live like nothing is different on December 26th, that wasn't the point. And if you post online things like he is the reason for the season and still there are people who are cold in our town or there are people who are hungry in our town and we haven't tried to help, then that wasn't the point of Jesus being born. And if we worship today, or if we worship at 4 or 4.30 or 7 or 11 on Christmas Eve, and we still threaten or complain or cheat or feel entitled rather than being content and grateful and counting our blessings, then apparently we would have missed the point entirely. Yes, Jesus was. Yes, Jesus is a king. And yes, I understand that without the right kind of king, it would be impossible to have the right kind of kingdom. And yes, I probably will continue to worship and pray and say my prayers. And for that matter, I probably will continue to proclaim that he's the reason for the season. And probably, since I'm a preacher, warn about commercialism too. But after I've done all of that, the point is not only that Jesus is my king, but then that that's supposed to make a difference to me. So after I'm done with all of that, the point is not only that Jesus came as Messiah, but that then I would choose to live under his kingship and under his lordship. See, after I'm done with all of those other things, the point is not only that I acknowledge Jesus as King, but that I acknowledge that I have an obligation to make sure the ones without coats are clothed, and the ones without food are fed. I have an obligation to count myself as blessed, rather than count myself as entitled. See, after all of the rest of the stuff, and after I know that Jesus is king, I know that it's also not supposed to just be about the king, but it's supposed to be also about the kingdom. And that means following Jesus' example. And that means that it has more to do with love than it does with power. It has more to do with charity than it does with commercialism. And it has more to do with people than it has to do with stuff. Because it's not just about the king, it's about the kingdom. And this is a kingdom you can trust because all other earthly kingdoms that we will build will eventually crumble. You want to know how I know that? I know that because the Huskers were five and seven this year. <laughs> love, forgiveness, hope, faith, sacrifice, care, charity, mercy. Those are things that never lose. So this Christmas, I hope for you that it's about the king, but not just about the king. I hope it's also about the kingdom. The hymn is number 275. <coughs> Thank you.
now profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we now receive our offering. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Israel has come, is here, and is coming soon. Let us join in prayer for the church, the <coughs> earth, and those who are in need, that all receive what God promises to give. I will end each petition with let us pray. Please respond. Have mercy, O oh God. For the church throughout the world, for bishops, pastors, and seminaries, for the courage to weigh out the challenges of our baptism, and for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. For the earth, for glaciers, for the protection of dormant vegetation, vegetation and hibernating animals, and for wisdom in the use and care of the creatures and landscapes we live among, let us pray. For the nations of the world, for soldiers and police, for all who suffer political oppression and for our enemies, let us pray. For all those in need, for those who are sick or cold, injured or outcast, for victims of fraud or extortion, especially for Don Schmidt and Sue Crabtree, let us pray. For this congregation, for joy in Christ and for our community, for an increase in practices that truly enact justice and compassion, let us pray. You are the source of eternal salvation. We remember before you the faithful witnesses who have gone before us, especially Charlotte Pickerel, and now rest forever in your peace. Let us pray. Have mercy, Lord. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. We pray for those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Sietta Swanson. May their day be joyful and full of gratitude to you and for the gift of life. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, for the lives of all the faithful departed, that we complete our baptismal journey in you. Let us pray. Receive our prayers, faithful God, as we watch and wait for your coming among us in Jesus Christ our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May you be filled with the wonder of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, and the peace of the Christ child. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. The closing hymn is 270, Hark the Herald, Angels Sing.